Olá pessoal, muito boa noite. A gente está começando aqui mais um episódio da nossa série de diálogos. Hoje é dia 27 de maio, excepcionalmente uma quarta-feira à noite, a gente gravando aqui direto da Vila Madalena. E vocês vão entender por quê, porque a gente não tinha como não gravar esse episódio e transmitir esse episódio para vocês. E eu tenho dois convidados aqui, um bem conhecido, e eu vou passar a palavra para ele, porque ele vai introduzir o nosso special guest da noite, né Marcelo? Seja bem-vindo, Marcelão. Tudo bem? Obrigado, Maurício. And then I'll shift into English. It's up to you. No, I think it's better that Sean can Definitely. follow up. That. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for open your house for it. And I'm, I'm very, very happy to have Sean here. So I've been studying integral theory for the last 15 years, and I had the privilege to know Sean while I was working for Natura four years ago, five years ago. But I was, before it, reading and following uh, Sean's work. I would say that, along with Ken Wilber, perhaps Sean is one of the most important scholars studying, researching, writing, and applying integral in, in the world. And then I'm very happy to be partnering with him in bringing meta-integral to Brazil and the approaches that are quite innovative to Brazil. In particular, this initiative that is to IR Brazil that we launched in 2011, uh, and Sean was here when we launched it. Um, it is an amazing work that uh, Sean is going to bring to us. But we had this amazing work that Ari Rainsford uh, uh, did for almost uh, three years in translating this. Uh, Small child here, <laughs> and uh, which is going to be about what you're going to dialogue and talk today. Uh, so I'm very, very happy and honored to have you here, Sean. Thank you very much to, to bring your wisdom and your love to, to us. So yeah. It's up to you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Sean. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Um, thank you, Marcelo, for your long-standing friendship and support and. For everyone who's here tonight, it's just so touching to, to feel the love and support for something that's very dear to my heart and, and that I've put a lot of myself into. Um, so let me start with answering the two questions I get the most with respect to this book is, one, how long did it take you to write it? <laughs> you can see it's, um, it's uh, 800 pages, so it's quite a, a big book. And, and why is it so big? Right? So these are two questions I'm often asked. And, So I'll, I'll start there. Um, it took at least 10 years to write, um, arguably longer, depending on how you think of it. When I was in college, I did my degree, I did a triple degree in philosophy, biology, and psychology. And I was studying animal consciousness. I wanted to understand what can we say about sentience, about animal awareness and plant awareness. And, And you know, what does the best research tell us about the emotions or the thinking capacities or the feeling dimensions, the somatic dimensions of organisms in general, animals in particular? So I spent four years getting an honors degree in this area. And at the same time, I was studying a lot of environmental philosophy. And I was leading a lot of trips into the wilderness, backpacking trips, kayaking trips, um, skiing trips, and, and taking college students out into the wilderness to experience the beauty of the natural world and to develop their own ecological awareness. So then I went to Africa with Peace Corps and I spent three years there. And while I was there, I worked in sanitation and building wells and pumps for communities around where I lived. And I was doing a lot of reading. I read over 200 books during my three years there. I was reading environmental philosophy, religion, psychology, literature, just the whole range of anything I could find, basically. And, and then a friend sent me Ken Wilber's book, A Brief History of Everything. And when I read that book, it was just like everything came together for me. All the work that I had done in animal consciousness, all the work I had done in environmental philosophy, and then reading all of these materials and all these different disciplines, all of a sudden came together in a very powerful way and I had my first sense of integral ecology. I, I saw the framework that Ken Wilber had articulated in his book as a powerful way to begin to bring together all of these insights. 
because my love for the planet is huge and, and I see so much suffering, I see so much fragmentation and, and I want so much to contribute to us having a thriving planetary civilization. And so I then left Africa and went back to graduate school. And originally I was going to get a PhD in the philosophy of biology because I really wanted to go deeper with animal consciousness, animal awareness. I really wanted to study it from a philosophical and a biological perspective. But then after reading Wilbur's work, I decided that actually I wanted to get a PhD in integral ecology, but no program existed, right? So I had to essentially create my own path. So I found a school in California, the California Institute of Integral Studies, that allowed me to create a program of study that enabled me to really develop integral ecology. So for the six years of being in my doctorate program, I spent every single paper that I got assigned from every single course I wrote on integral ecology. So at the end of the six years, I had written over 40, 20 to 30 page papers on some aspect of integral ecology. So all of this time I was refining and developing the framework. And on my committee was Michael Zimmerman, a professor from um, Tulane um, at the time in Louisiana, but then has since moved to University of Colorado in Boulder. And so I ended up writing like a 300 page manuscript for a dissertation. And after I finished and I got my doctorate, I asked Michael if he would join me as a co-author to take this manuscript, my dissertation, and expand it into the book that I felt really needed to be written in order to really tend to the complexity of the topic. And he agreed. So we took my 300 pages and we added 900 more pages. And we ended up with a 1,200 page manuscript, which when published becomes an 800 page book. And, and so we did that writing for over five years. So if you combine that five years of writing with the six years of doing the work um, and all those papers, and then if you even go back farther with all the work I did as a college student with animal consciousness, you know, then clearly this has really been a life's project for me. It's been something I've poured my whole being into. And, and, it's, and I began really feeling that I wanted to write a book that would last for over 100 years. Because one thing I noticed, as because I, I read a lot, I saw how a lot of books would be published, and just in a few years, they basically were done. Their contribution was over. They didn't add much more to the conversation. And I thought, I don't want to write a book and have it be finished um, and not have value beyond just a few years. I want to write a book that's going to be adding fresh insights to people's thinking for the next 100 plus years. And so I began looking at the books that I've read that were over 100 years old that were still adding to the conversation. And I used those as a model for how to think about what's required to write a book that can last that long. And one answer that I have for that is you have to write it from the total depths of your being. You have to bring everything forward. And, and so there's a way in which this book really captures my full transmission of what it means to be human and how that humanness can be in relationship to the natural world. And, and so it's been a long process in writing it, and obviously it took Ari almost three years to translate it. You know, so, so it's a book that it requires a lot you know, to read, to translate, to engage. And, and because it's an integral book, it's including a lot. So now let me just respond to why is it so big, um, since I just responded to the, the frequent question of, you know, how long did it take you to write? So it's this big because I realized that a lot of it is theory, and I wanted to complement that theory with practice. So there's a whole chapter devoted to actual practices you can do with your own awareness, like meditation practices, to expand your awareness to, to be more ecological and environmental. And so I developed a whole series of practices that people can use. And some people have been working with those practices for you know, over five years. And it's really amazing to hear stories now of people who are actually doing those practices and how it supports their own ecological and integrative thinking. So there's a chapter on practices. There's also 300 pages of footnotes, right? So there's 500 pages of text, 300 pages of footnotes. And in a way, the book really lies in the footnotes, which is a style that Ken Wilber himself has. And when this book a few years ago was published in German and translated into German, 
they decided they didn't have enough money to publish the whole book, so they cut out the end notes, the footnotes. <laughs> and I was like, oh, no, you can't do that. Like, that's the main part of the – that's like cutting you know, off your arm and leg and then asking you to run down the road. I was like, so I'm so excited that here we're publishing the whole book um, that Ari has translated. So there's 300 pages of really in-depth notes that go into citations and all the research and to really support the material that I'm building in the main body of the text. And then there's an appendix that's like 30 pages long that lists out a small paragraph for each of the 200 perspectives that I identified as being important perspectives that we should include in our response to the natural world. And one way to think of this is, given the biodiversity that we have on the planet, it's no wonder that we would have just as much diversity when it comes to how we think about the natural world and the different schools of ecology that have developed to understand that complexity. Right? And so, and then the main body of the work, and I'll just mention this briefly and then we can open it up to engagement, is I present, Michael and I present a framework, which I call the who, how, what framework. So there's the who times the how times the what. And what this refers to is, to use some big philosophical words initially, is the epistemology of the people and animals that are relating to the environment, and how they know what they know, times the how, which is the methods, the methods that we use as scientists or psychologists or environmental activists or geologists um, or with animals in terms of the senses that they use, right? Seeing, hearing, and tasting, and so forth, times the what. Like, what part of reality are you focusing on, right? And so you're focusing on you know, the, the systemic aspects or the behavioral aspects or the psychological aspects or the cultural or values aspects, right? And so this framework is an integral framework that highlights to understand the complexity of the natural world, not only do we need to look at all the different aspects of the natural world that we can focus on, but we need to understand all the different methodologies that we can use to understand that. And then we also need to understand who's looking, right? Who is the, the person that's picking up the methodology to understand the natural world, right? And so this formula helps us understand why there are so many different perspectives, why there's over 200. Because some of them focus on the looker, some focus on the mode of looking, and some focus on what's being looked at, right? So an integral formula includes all three and understands the relationship between them and how to really solve our environmental issues, we need to take into account all three. If you just look at climate change, there's so many different aspects of climate change we can examine from the what perspective, right? But then there's tons of methodologies. There's dozens and dozens of methodologies that reveal different aspects of those natural phenomenon. And then you have all the scientists and the politicians and the environmentalists and the average person with their values and their worldviews and how they relate to climate change. So the fact that climate change is a topic we can't really agree on at least in the states, we have a hard time agreeing on it. Um, but there's a lot of debate, even for the people who agree that it's happening, there's debate over the methodologies we should be using or how we should understand the values related to it. So unless you're bringing in all three of those elements, I would argue you have something less than an integral approach and your effort probably will not be as successful. And so for me, a successful approach begins by recognizing these three dimensions bringing in psychology and values and worldviews, spirituality and religion, bringing in an understanding of all the different methodologies that we can use. And not just the typical scientific methodologies, but dialogical methodologies, spiritual methodologies, um, relational methodologies, um, and then all the complexity of, of what we can focus on. So let me stop there and, and open it up to engagement and, and see where, where we go tonight. Great. Where do we go tonight? Well, we have, we have, we have uh, a gente tem uma, uma, como eu falei no começo, uma, um público ótimo. Então, quem quiser fazer perguntas ou observações. mesmo observações, faça. Mas eu vou fazer a primeira pergunta. Então. <risos> Porque eu que tenho o dedo aqui no botão de edição. Sou certo? dono da bola. <risos> so, Sean, uh, once you've, you've published the book, uh, what kind of people you've attracted by mm. integral ecology? What yeah. What kind of people? I, I think it, it's it's a so broad, yeah. you know, uh, issues that 
I'm curious about what kind of what kind of what kind of people have looked for you and for the theory in the book. Yeah, yeah, great question. You know, in the book, I actually didn't mention, but there's three chapters that are case studies by other people, and one of them is by Brian Tissett, who uses the integral ecology framework to look at the issue of fisheries in Hawaii, right? So the tropical fish that live on the reefs, and one of the challenges he faces there is the native Hawaiians have certain rights to the reefs um, that have been negotiated with the state. And so they approach the, the natural world in a particular way and want a certain kind of use. Then you have the aquarium fisheries that are wanting to come in and capture the fish and then send them to aquariums across the world. And then you have the tourists who are coming in and they want to go snorkeling and go see the beautiful fish underwater in the reefs. So you have these three very different stakeholders, the native Hawaiians, the aquarium fishery industry, and the tourists. And there was a lot of conflict over how to work with the natural resource of the reefs and work with the fish, and, and whether it should be a tourist thing or it should be captured or should be left alone, according to um, the native Hawaiians, and in some cases, used for food. And so he used an integral approach to navigate that complexity and to come to agreements and understandings between those different um, groups of people. Right? Gail Hachachka, who's also featured in the book, she's in the book and then also since then has been doing a lot of work in Latin America and um, El Salvador and, and other countries, um, mostly in Central America, I believe, but also in Peru. And she uses an integral approach in those contexts, uh, often drawing on the ecological frameworks and aspects that are outlined in the book, she looks at first-person methodologies, second-person methodologies, and third-person methodologies. And what that means is she uses a number of different methodologies, some that focus on the objective aspects of the situation, some that focus on the intersubjective or community or relational aspects, and then some that focus on the subjective or the psychological or the interior or, or emotional aspects. So she goes into communities and works with the communities with these different methodologies to understand how to work towards you know, creating you know, environmental policy, um, ordinances, working with the women and how they are using natural resources, working with the men and, and how they're working with the natural resources. And then, you know, so there's been a wide range. Those are just two kind of quick examples. But there are politicians, there are environmentalists, there's a lot of psychologists. Um, it's starting to make more inroads into corporate business contexts. There's a guy, Steve Shine, who just finished his PhD at Fielding University, which is in the US, in Santa Barbara. And he has been developing a way of assessing the levels of consciousness in terms of ecological awareness and then working with corporate executives and Fortune 500 companies to get them to think more about how they can bring um, integral ecology and ecological awareness into the sustainability initiatives that they're doing right now, right? And also, you know, recently the Pope, our beautiful Pope Francis, has announced that he's going to release a statement on climate change, I believe in July, and it's very rare, like, popes haven't typically you know, taken a position on the environment. So that in itself is quite noteworthy. But what's even more interesting to me is he's calling his approach integral ecology, <laughs> right? And I thought, really? holy smokes. Like, <laughs> oh. So it's like, is he talking about this or is he talking about something else? And, and so it doesn't seem that like he's referencing the book, but I have been able to read a few articles that outline the principles that he's identified. And all of them match beautifully with the spirit and the impulse of this book. So while it's a different integral ecology, it's, it's in the same tradition as what we're doing here. And actually this you know, comes out of a tradition that is informed by two streams of Catholic thinking, right? Because there were two um, groups that began using integral ecology in 1995, right? So the first use of integral ecology was Leonardo Boff, who I believe is Brazilian, yeah? Yeah. yeah? yeah. And so he wrote a book, Cry the Earth, Cry the Poor. And in that book, he talks about integral ecology, and then he also does in a few other publications. And, and then um, Thomas Berry, who was a, a Catholic priest and an eco-theologian who passed away a few years ago, his book, um, um, The Dream of the Earth, uses the phrase integral and ecology over 100 times in his book. 
So, so to me, it's very exciting to think that the Pope might be tapping into those traditions of thinking and be putting forward a framework that has a lot of resonance with this. And part of where it resonates is he's highlighting the importance of bringing in the psychology and the spirituality and the whole human being and the development of the human being, that that needs to be brought forward in the context of our response to the environment. The last example I'll give to your question is Michael Zimmerman, my colleague and co-author. He's teamed up with another integral pioneer named Steve McIntosh, who's done a lot of work around integral politics. They, I put them in touch with the Nature Conservancy, which is one of the clients that MedIntegral Associates has in the U.S. And the Nature Conservancy is arguably the largest NGO on the planet. Right? I think they actually are, depending on how you look at it. And so Michael and Steve are flying out to Washington, D.C., I think in the next week or two, to meet with one of the head people at the Nature Conservancy to talk about an integral approach to their climate change initiative and how they can reframe the narrative that they've been using for climate change more along the lines of what's presented here. So, so there's a wide range of, of people in many different professions that are drawing on aspects of this. So it's very exciting. And my sense with this being published in Brazil, Brazil is a hotbed of, of integrative thinking and action. You know, there's the culture here is very receptive to more holistic, transpersonal, cultural, and psychological aspects. So my hope and my sense is it's gonna gain a lot of traction and really support and influence some of the initiatives that are occurring here in Brazil as well. Good. It's important to say that uh, Sean was mentioning the book. Let me show the book here. Oh, uh, the book is uh, this one. Well, sorry. Here's at the Livraria Cultura. The book is in English yet. We, yeah. are, we are working to to translate that. The book is translated, translated working, to, working to publish. Yeah. And uh, as you mentioned, we're working to publish. Ari is also here. Let me show Ari. He's over there. Yeah. How long did you take to translate the book? Two years, three months, 27 months. 27 months. Okay. Questions, questions, remarks. Quem quer fazer? Have you have one. Go ahead. Shen, uh, you, you talk about uh, you, you talk about the book, and uh, when the first time I saw the book and we started to talk about it, I said, hey, ecology, integral ecology, this is related with St. Francis, because St. Francis mm -hmm. was like a, right. a, a reference yeah. since ever. And now you mentioned the Pope. Yeah. Uh, so my question is, did you reach this uh, old uh, approach about uh, uh, ecology, yeah. the ancient approach from ecology, like Jainism, uh, uh, Francis, the uh, Franciscans, yeah. and there is some intention to bring this back, yeah. and how you think that this book can influence this uh, new consciousness based on the Catholics or the new religions, yeah. based on what Francis uh, uh, thought about it. Because it's like uh, the, the message from, from Francis, every time it's come back. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like a yeah. cycle. And as, as you told the Pope, uh, uh, talk about the book or not. It's more related on, uh, about their approach with the Francis, yeah. or it was influenced by the book, for mm -hmm. example. So I want to uh, some comments about this yeah. relation between the future and right. the Asian, based on uh, uh, the college. Yeah. Who, who is asking? Eu sou Eduardo Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. It's a wonderful inquiry. Yeah, there, there are examples of integral ecologists going way, way back, right? And, you know, and in the book, there's a framework that I present called the ecological selves. It looks at the development of different ecological worldviews and how the ecological thinking changes and shifts over time with as more and more complexity is brought into the awareness. And so there's names like the eco-warrior, the eco-strategist, and, um, and one of them is the eco-sage. And St. Francis is an example of an eco-sage. Right, someone who's really unified their awareness with the natural world, right? And so, and you know, there are a lot of our religious leaders and even the shamans and, and many of, you know, the individuals throughout history 
have had elements of this, right? And so it is important to reach back and connect with, with those traditions and those individuals and bring them forward and to show how, you know, part of what's happening here is what's been happening for a long, long time. And then there's another element where the complexity is so vast now and there's so many scientific traditions. I mean, in terms of schools of ecology, there's at least 80, right? 80 different schools of ecology that's like, you know, population ecology, systems ecology, evolutionary ecology. The fact that there's 80 alone, you know, like that's just like mind boggling, right? So, so there's a way in which this presents like the intuitive spiritual side alongside the cognitive analytic side, right? And it marries those and says we need both, right? So St. Francis would be a, a stronger representative of that kind of intuitive mystical side. And so how do we cultivate that ecological awareness in ourselves? And that's where those, that chapter of practices that I mentioned support that, right? So that we can tap into our own experience along the lines of what St. Francis and, and other individuals like him have experienced. And then how do we marry that with the, the power of the cognitive mind, the power of scientific methodology, the power of you know, computer simulations and, and the kinds of analysis we can do and the big data we can do, right, and really bring those together. And in a way, that's kind of summarized as an integral approach, right? It's kind of like the brain and the heart, you know, working together to, to serve the planet. Um, you know, one of the things that I really love about St. Francis that I think is important to highlight here is he really got that the animals had their own awareness, right? He treated them in an I-thou relationship, right? He recognized their sentience, their awareness, and he treated them as if they had that, right? And so, you know, and that is one of the important parts of integral ecology. There's a whole chapter in here that looks at animal awareness and how would the science of ecology be radicalized if, if it included the, the evidence and the research that's been done on animal awareness, right? Because generally the methodologies of science take that out, and appropriately so for those methodologies, right? But this is a multi-method approach to ecology. So we include the, the traditional systemic methodologies that just look at the energy flows and the kind of population dynamics and the behavioral analytics, we include that. But in addition to that, we bring to it all the amazing methodologies that show us that animals have feelings and thoughts and experiences that can and should be incorporated into our understanding of the ecological environment. There's some amazing research happening in Yellowstone that looks at the role that fear has with elk in relationship to wolves that are hunting the elk, right? So, so they're analyzing the, the dynamics of how fear is experienced and communicated across populations of elk and how that plays into the predator-prey dynamic. So there's some very innovative ways to bring emotions into ecology and to understand the emotional dimension of animals and how the emotions of the wolves and the emotions of the elk are interacting. Right? And so I think there's some profound ways that we actually can bridge this um, and bring, bring it into the science of ecology and really shift how we do and practice ecology by recognizing that animals are sentient and with that sentient come certain qualities of experience that are worth taking into account and understanding better. Another question? I, I have one. Se vocês me deixarem, eu vou fazer todas. Um, I've seen you've, you've served several different types of tribes here. Academics, yeah. executives, corporations, yeah. you know, education, I don't know. Uh, could, you, could you say something about him? Mm. How, how is to serve with your, you know, theory, yeah. all those different tribes? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's part of being integral, right? Is that you it ends up taking you in places that you would never imagine. And because you're, you're wanting to seek out new perspectives, right, and trying to understand those and coordinate those. And so I, professionally, I began as an academic and a scholar and a researcher, where I went really deep in the theory of this, and I developed ways people could apply this in the world. And then I did some of that application myself, but I mostly was creating the models and the framework so that other people could take it into the world and apply it. And then I would mentor and coach and, and teach them on how to apply it. 
So I was more on the theory side, though I was always trying to find ways to connect with the practice side. At a certain point, when I was a full professor, a chair of a program, had just led a very successful global conference where we brought together 500 people from around the planet, 30 different countries, around integral applications, I had an epiphany. I had this um, insight that I could stay in the academy and I could continue to have the impact that I was having, or I could actually step out of the academy and go into business and have more impact. Because part of what I saw, part of my analysis was, wow, we're destroying the planet. Seems pretty clear. You know? <laughs> and one of the main drivers of that is economics and business and, and the way we approach um, our natural resources. And so in a way, I took to heart this and said, all right, actually, that's where the leverage points are. I want to find a way to bring this more directly into business and organizations and start to transform organizations to have a triple bottom line approach, to be more sensitive to the kinds of topics and issues here, which is why it's so wonderful to team up with Marcelo um, in this context and, and do the work that we're doing. And so for me, it's like the reason I've shifted from these different tribes, right, has really just been following the deep love I have for one, integral theory on the one hand, and the planet on the other hand. And how do I bring that together in the most powerful way to have the most impact globally? And so it's carried me, like I would have never imagined going into business. I mean, I, I just, I'm, I would rather be meditating and, and reading books and writing <laughs> books, you know, in a cave somewhere. And, and yet there's a feeling that the world wants me to do something other than that right now. And, and that I have a responsibility um, and so, and who knows where it'll take me next, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's been a very wild adventure, you know, and I think part of the beauty of following your heart is it takes you places you would have never imagined, mm -hmm. so. You know, Shen, my, my wife says that this is my, the main cave we have in, mm. in this house, so yeah. some, some way you are in the cave. <laughs> right, right, yeah, yeah, and happy to some be way. here. <laughs> some other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Sean, thank you for being here. It's really amazing to see those words together. Mm -hmm. Religion, spirituality, philosophy, science. Mm -hmm. um, I was just wondering, what has been the response? I mean, you've been involved actively with this for 10 years. Yeah. Mainstream scientific community. Yeah. How are they reacting to that group of words articulated yeah. together in yeah. such an eloquent, beautiful way? Um, what have been your experience with that? I mean, have, have they been accepting yeah. or how are There's you looking at your work? Yeah. Is Fabio? Flavia. Flavia. Yeah, it's, there's a lot of resistance to it, right? You know, so it's kind of both. It's like on the one hand, in the mainstream context, there's a lot of resistance. But what I often hear from those individuals is, they themselves are interested in bringing those different streams of understanding together, but the organization, the system, the, the, the discipline itself is very resistant. And, you know, and so it's very provocative for them to hear me talking about animal awareness and how might we include that. And a lot of them are open to it, but they don't know how they would begin to do that. And there's a, you know, Mark Beckoff, who wrote the foreword to this, is a trained ecologist. And he's one of the, the leaders on the planet for doing traditional scientific ecology, but in a way that includes and acknowledges animal emotions and animal awareness. And so he's a real pioneer in that. So I often will point them to his work as, as a bridge between kind of what we're doing here, because they really need examples of, you know, traditional ecologists doing traditional ecological research that are starting to bring some of this in. So then this example I just gave about the f research around fear with elk and wolves, right? So there's more and more examples like that that are actually allowing many of these scientists who are open to these ideas but don't know how to move forward with them because they don't have good examples of what that looks like. So, so a lot of times they are supportive of this, but they're just not sure how to move it forward. Um, the other areas where it receives more embrace is more in terms of looking at human psychology and human values, human spirituality, and how we can include that in the conversation. 
And so a lot of environmental activists and, and policymakers and, and even ecologists that are working more with like, you know, human dynamics, you know, see the importance of including human psychology and human cultural theory. Because over and over again, they see examples of trying to move sustainability initiatives forward and them getting bogged down due to worldview conflicts, right? And so there's a painful recognition that we need to find a way to honor and include the different worldviews and perspectives because otherwise we're not going to have alliance around how to move these issues forward. So in that context, there's actually a lot of embrace with, with what's presented here and a real openness to spirituality and philosophy and psychology, right? So in a sense, that's the easier sale. The harder sale is working with traditional ecologists and having them include animal consciousness in what they're doing, right? And in a way, that's the more radical proposition of this. Uh, thank you for your question. Yeah, please. Uh, you said some years ago that uh, you decided to leave the academic world yeah. and be comfortable with all your research and intellectual issues and so on and try to work these ideas in the corporate world. world. Yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit more about this and mm. how the corporate world is looking to your, your work and, mm. and how your book can help the mm. corporate, uh, corporate world to have uh, a deeper awareness about these issues. Yeah, yeah great. Ricardo, we all, we all know you, but uh, <laughs> you could, oh. you know. Ricardo, maybe. Mm -hmm. And I might ask Marcelo, too, to contribute to, to this response. Um, you know, in a way, I have one foot in both worlds because, you know, I'm, I'm such an academic, and I love theory, and I love research, and I love writing. And so that's, that's an area that I continue to, to be a leader in. But, yeah, you're right. Like, I've really, I've stepped into a very different landscape around business and organizations and, and the corporate environment. And... And like this research I just mentioned around Steve Shine, like I feel some major changes have happened in the last five years alone around this topic. So in a way, this book was first published in English six years ago. And it was almost, in that sense, it was kind of a little bit ahead of its time. I don't think I could be taking this into the corporate environment six years ago the way I am now. And so the fact that Steve Shine has been interviewing all these corporate executives in the C-suite about sustainability and their ecological self and using the framework of integral ecology to expose them to a wider range of ideas to me is a really interesting signal that things are shifting in a pretty dramatic way, at least in some sections of, of business. You know, the, the movement of conscious capitalism, social impact, you know, um, social entrepreneurship, you know, the, the effort to create hybrid organizations between for-profit and non-profit. Like, there's a lot of creative entrepreneurship that's happening out there. And, and so they're coming up with new and creative ways to respond to our current situation and address the ways in which business as usual is not working, right? And so the complexity that we're facing in terms of the business landscape, in terms of globally, in terms of the markets, in terms of the environment, you know, sustainability is now a household name, right? And, and so there's a way in which sustainability has been greenwashed. It's been like, you know, hijacked in a sense by corporate interests, which is both a blessing and a curse, right? Because it, it then gives us a doorway in to an extent because on, on paper, at least, they're committed to having, you know, a sustainability initiative as part of their corporate agenda. And yet part of what's happening with those organizations, those companies, is they've committed in various degrees to including the natural world in what they're doing, and yet it's so complex, they don't know how to move that forward. And so the integral framework here gives them a way of doing that. And so part of what we do with leaders in this space is work with them around complexity, how integrative thinking and action can support them to navigate the complexity, and how they can integrate planetary issues and concerns with their corporate interests, that it's not an either or, right? That we really like support them in their kind of more traditional economic activities and organizational goals, but we show through an integ integral approach how we can situate that in a larger container, right? And so that's where a lot of the kind of rewiring and the shifting of the mental models is, is helping to operationalize the triple bottom line. And also most organizational challenges, in my experience, 
are usually related to psychological dynamics or cultural dynamics. And so again, they often don't have a, a viable way of kind of working with those realities and integrating them into the more behavioral and systemic aspects of their work. So the more we're able to work with them to include psychological and cultural aspects, it really creates an opening for us to begin introducing some of the concepts and ideas and frameworks associated with integral ecology and how they can include that in what they're doing in a way that doesn't ask them to leave some of their really important aspects at the, at the door. So Marcella, what else would you add? I'm just adding that actually sustainability is a uh, it's been around for 20 years, I would say. And then uh, what I see now that's opening the doors to talk in more in depth about it, it is uh, I recently been involved with two initiatives that I see gaining more um, momentum in the organization. One is around purpose and meaning. Mm -hmm. So quite a lot of companies is integrating and, and bringing meaning and purpose to companies which is a way to talk about spirituality without connecting spirituality to religion. So it's right. about what is the higher meaning of uh, enterprise and how we can connect. It. And also it's being kind of overwhelming, a little bit kind of uh, wash, but mindfulness. More and more companies is bringing mindfulness to the work mm -hmm. environment. I would say that Along with some other aspects, I see the same what happened with sustainability 20 years ago, even before the world was uh, used. There is something going on right now in organizations, creating this momentum to companies addressing uh, their challenges because they are all, it, it, in, they are not doing it because they like or because they are nice, but just because they are wow. struggling and they are facing real big challenges. And I, I would say that all those elements emerging are creating the doors for bringing those uh, perspectives into the work environment. Yeah, and just one little comment. Um, one of the things I point out here is that for something to be sustainable, the, the more of reality you include, the more sustainable it's going to be. And so the more you include psychological and cultural aspects as well as behavioral and systemic, it's going to be more sustainable. And so you can use the focus on sustainability as a way of saying, if you want it to be more sustainable, you have to include more of reality. And these frameworks give you a way to do that. So like when I was in Peace Corps and we built latrines and pumps and did a lot, you know, we didn't include the psychological and cultural aspects. So we'd go into a village and create this new technology and put a pump in and then no one would use it because we ended up putting it in a place that culturally was not a place where men and women could come and mix. Right. You know, so so it wasn't very sustainable, even though it was, quote, sustainable technology, you know, funded by, you know, you know, World Vision and other NGOs. So over and over again, I saw that if you don't include the psychological and cultural aspects, what you're trying to do in a sustainability context is not going to be a sustainable. So by including more of reality and using the frameworks in here, then your initiatives can be more sustainable. And so that often resonates. They get that on some level and they see that they need to start thinking more integratively in order for things to be more sustainable. So thank you for your question. No question? Yeah. Go ahead. Hi, Shep. Hi. Uh, my name is Marta. Marta? I, uh, yes. I'm still reading your book. Oh, you good. Uh, yeah. I'm working on a um, project since last year yeah. about the water. Mm. And I, I would like to ask you, how? How do you see the society uh, behavior? Yeah. Because I have a, a sense that uh, Sao Paulo uh, society yeah. is, is sleepwalking into a catastrophe. Yeah. Nobody is talking about it. Yeah. Nobody recognizes what is going to happen in uh, three months. Yeah. And I'm searching for answers to, mm. to understand this behavior because I have the feeling that we lost the fear. Yeah. Because I ask about the people, um, okay, the, the water is going to, to end. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, how, how are you going to live yeah. with our water? And uh, I, I think that in California, they are having the same yeah. problem. Yeah. And, okay, and how can we... <coughs> Do you have a, 
something to mm. tell her about this yeah. because for me, it's, I can't understand. Yeah, can't I'm we searching fix for, it? for this yeah. answer. Yeah. Um, I'm writing it about it. Yeah, I think this issue, you know, the little bit I understand about the water issue here in Sao Paulo, it's like it really points to some of the key dynamics we see in lots of different places. And, you know, one of them is our inability as people typically to really perceive something unless it's actually in front of us, right? And, you know, and so, so there's a lot of different, you know, there, you know, there's a school called environmental psychology and a school called ecological psychology and a school called eco-psychology, right? So these are just three of many schools of environmental thought that look at why do human beings behave the way that you're describing? when a threat is on us and is happening, and yet we have, assumingly, are kind of somehow not perceiving it, and we act as if it's not happening, right? And so there are different kind of psychological dynamics that are occurring. So those schools of psychology look at that and look at it, what's called like environmental perception, like how we perceive the environment, right? And then there's schools that look at how that then plays into values, right? And, and so, you know, being in a city you know, even though there are a lot of parks and natural spaces and, you know, and, and Brazil is filled with beauty, there's a way in which some people point out that just being in the city environment cuts us off from the natural world in a way where we're not inclined to make those links. Like, we don't understand those links, right? And so in a way, we have to kind of rebuild the linkages in terms of our awareness um, and our environment. And this is why, at least in the U.S., there's a big movement of taking kids out and having them experience the natural world, right? A lot of programs that are like reconnecting children to nature, right? And, and how that's essential to build a, a certain kind of awareness and perception so that when these kinds of issues we face, we actually can make the link, right? It's almost kind of like when you go to the supermarket and you buy your meat, your steak, and you only get it in the package, and that's how you've always gotten it for 40, 50 years, like, you don't always connect that it actually comes from a cow that's on, you know, pasture land, you know, you know, 100 kilometers. You know, it's like we, we don't make those links. And so it, it enables us to, in a sense, have wrong thinking, right? The other piece is, is around fear and, and self-needs. You know, one of the key frameworks in here highlights that if you want environmental action to occur, you have to take care of people's egocentric needs alongside their what's called ethnocentric needs, so like their family or group needs, alongside their, their socio-centric needs, meaning like their society or, or country needs, along with the planet-centric needs, right? And so what happens often with environmental initiatives is they'll focus on kind of the, the national or planet-centric level and, and have messages that are based around, you know, saving the planet, you know, or, you know, serving your country. But if you don't speak to and address the egocentric needs, then those messages are often fall on deaf ears. So part of what you know, this book and people working with these frameworks do is they develop strategies that work with individuals in an initiative like water, like raising the water awareness, of actually digging into what are the egocentric needs, like the self needs and the base needs, and, and how are those playing into the fear and the emotions and the dynamics where people are just basically kind of ignoring the issue. So, so part of it involves understanding that, that layer of what's happening more thoroughly because, you know, and so much of our environmental approaches don't include those psychological dynamics or the fear dynamics in a very sophisticated way. And so we end up banging our heads against the wall as we're trying to bring awareness to these people around, do you understand what's happening with the water shortage and what that's going to mean for you and your family even in a few months? So, yeah, so I don't have an answer, but it's more of like, you know, what are some layers of reality that maybe people working on this challenge can include more fully that would help to unlock and open um, some of these dynamics and help us understand it because it doesn't make any sense. Why, why would people not be responding to this situation? Because the implications of it are extreme. Like even in California, there are people saying that in 50 years, over half of the population in California will have to move. I mean, that's just, you know, it's hard to imagine, but, you know, 
a lot of people who are pretty smart are saying that. So <laughs> it seems that it's a possibility. But and it can be in three months. Yeah, I know. It can have some yeah. power going out. Yeah, I know. Millions of people. And part of it is I think we've been so inundated with environmental catastrophe that there's a way in which even though it's three months, it's like it might as well be three years. You know, it's like there's a way in which we've kind of been desensitized to environmental fallout, right? And so in a way, some people argue that until we actually experience some of that and resensitize ourselves, that it's going to be hard to get people's attention. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an unbelievable situation. And my heart goes out to you and everyone who's you know, trying to shift that and, and create some, some opportunities where, where Sao Paulo is uh, impacted the way it could be. We, ha we have some people with us on the internet. Can I, can I give the voice for them? Uh, Rosa Alegria is here. Uh, he met, he's saying that he met you in oh. San Francisco at Kennedy College. Oh, yeah. She's, uh, she's saying it's a privilege to hear mm. you again. And uh, Christina has a question for you. Yes. Uh, how, inter how integral ecology can be presented at formal education process, at schools for young children or, or on other programs? Mm. Yeah. And there's actually a number of people who are doing work in this area because many of the ideas and frameworks here work really well with youth and environmental literacy programs and environmental education programs. And so, you know, in the chapter that has the practices, for instance, some of those practices can be used with children, right? And so, you know, I think the simple way is to create curriculum where you take children out and they learn about the behavioral, the systemic, the psychological, and the cultural aspects of a situation, right? So you could have children that break into teams, right, depending on their age, where they do, they take a single topic, you know, like, you know, the water issue in Sao Paulo, and they study it for a couple of weeks from each perspective, either in, in different teams or maybe as a class they go through and study it. So they, under, they look at the behavioral dynamics that are contributing to this. Then the next week, you know, they study the systemic aspects, you know, the policies, the laws, the ordinances, the, the way the, the water system is, you know, spread out across the city, the, you know, and then they spend a week looking at the cultural dynamics, and then they spend a week looking at the psychological dynamics, right? So there's a lot of, I think, really easy ways to bring this into, um, you know, an educational context. And, you know, if she emails me, um, you know, I can try and connect her with some of the people who are doing this kind of work. Great. Um, Great. Questions? 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 Uh, along the line of this question related to human awareness, mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to make uh, some statements so that uh, perhaps it will be the basis for the question I want to address to you. First, I had the opportunity to grow through some pages mm. that are available for reading in the Google. Yeah. And I was very much pleased with mm -hmm. the idea because uh, as a biologist too, nature is systemic and integrated. Mm. Yeah. Ecology is an integrated science by itself. But when you go to the academics, mm. the university, and research and development, they fraction science and technology into disciplines, conventional disciplines. Mm -hmm. Then a person that studies animal ecology, they do animal ecology by itself, plant yeah. ecology, right. plant ecology by itself. Even the ecologists, they, lead, they, they work with the integrated, necessarily integrated science, but they do integration, they don't do integration. And I think that's the basic reason why the academics are reluctant yeah. into manage with this kind of uh, problematics. Mm. <clears throat> the second statement is that when you read about how to sensitize people for sustainability, not for sustainability as a general pro pro purpose, but sustainability as a way of staying here as a human mm. species, of staying here for as long as possible in this practical way of life. Uh, there are people who say, don't frighten people, because if they are frightened, they say, okay, since there is no solution, 
what can I do? I will continue doing the way I do. Right. Others say, tell people the beautiness of the planet, right. all the yeah. good things, only the good things that yeah. perhaps will motivate them to change their behavior. So we have this division. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> I will go back for a lecture that I had 62 years ago. Mm -hmm. A German zoologist in a lecture made the following statement. And I'm making this because I've been looking for this kind of explanation and I never found it. He mentioned the property of the animals that he called extraterritorial, causal extraterritorial behavior. Mm. And it translated this thing. Uh, when you hurt an animal, the animal perhaps does not know where the, the problem came from, but the first thing that he tried to do is to get away of that mm. place because he feels that there is a danger. Something is putting his life in danger. And I was hoping that the humans would have this property too. Mm -hmm. Because if we are able to feel a pressing problem and we are being hurt even in, in a slightest way and we feel that a danger is coming, we should move outside of this situation. And that would be a strategy for telling people right. Be aware of the water problem, be aware of pollution, be aware of uh, economics uh, mistakes, be aware of corruption, be aware of political mistakes. Uh, do you have any comments? Do you have to do do tackle these things in your yeah. book? Because it's a conjunction yeah. of psychological, religious, political right. awareness related to the environment. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very interesting series of statements, and yeah, so I'll respond, and then you can let me know if, if it touches into the, the areas that you're wanting to explore. You know, so yeah, there are the environmental pessimists, you know, on the one hand, and environmental optimists on the one hand, and so there are very different sense of the strategies in terms of communication that we might use to um, initiate, you know, the kind of changes and behaviors that we realize are necessary and you know and so I think there is something to be said about you know communicating the dire situation that we're in to people as a way of getting their attention and you know inspiring a change in, in attitude and action and and yet at the same time a lot of the sociological research shows us though I don't presume that this is the only thing but I think it's an interesting insight that when people are feeling the pain uh, in an environmental sense, that they tend to be more conservative in, in their behaviors and actions, right? And so this goes against what a lot of people say, that once we start feeling the pain, then that will be a catalyst to a whole new level of kind of, you know, sustainable action, right? And so it's kind of like it's got to get worse before it gets better. I think there's truth to that. But at the same time, some of the research shows that, that when it gets worse, people contract and they become more conservative. They, they focus more on their own egocentric needs and their survival needs. And then making that big leap becomes even harder to do. So in developmental theory, there's an understanding that transformation of, of worldview and of action seems to be the result of 100% support and 100% challenge, right? So when someone feels really supported and at the same time they feel really challenged, that that's a, a magical combination that allows transformation to occur in the direction that we would want people to go in terms of, of us becoming more aware of our environmental impact. So in a sense what this is saying, and this is trying to link it to what you're, is we need both the pessimism, right? The sky's falling, the environment's collapsing, things are really bad, so, you know, it's like, so like the challenge. And then we also need the support, right? That, the, you know, that things are okay, there's gonna be stability, they're like, you're gonna be okay, your family's gonna be okay. It's like, somehow we need both, right? And one of the things that I talk about in here is, is this saying that things are getting worse, at the same time, things are getting better, at the same time, things are perfect just as they are. 
And the invitation, it's in a sense, it's kind of a spiritual practice. The invitation is to place our awareness at the intersection of those three perspectives, right? Because when we look out at the news, we see hundreds and hundreds of examples of things getting worse, right? So that's the challenge. Like, poof, we, we better change our, our behavior soon, otherwise, you know, we're in trouble as a species. And that's the challenge. At the same time, things are getting better. You can look out and there are hundreds of examples of, of things getting better, like new laws being passed, new organizations, um, new projects, you know, breaking new ground with like creating like, I mean, there are amazing, inspiring examples out there of how human beings are working together to save different parts of, of nature, to create ecological awareness, right? So you can just look at those examples, say it's getting better. Like there's never been arguably more ecological awareness on this planet than there is right now in terms of people and, and the total globe, right? There's never been more protected spaces on the planet than there is now, right? So there's a lot of examples that highlight that it's getting better, right? But then there's also the fact it's getting worse. So it's a contradiction. It's a paradox. How can both be true? And so what I suggest in the book is that somehow we need to open up ourselves to the paradox of that. And then out of that can come the, the quality of transformation and motivation that I think we're really needing. If we're only giving the challenge, it's really bad, we're in deep trouble, that actually is, the research shows, the, the meditative traditions and the psychological traditions suggest that that actually doesn't inspire change. So if we only do that, we're in trouble. If we only say things are getting better and look at all the great examples and technology is going to you know, be our way out, then it's just support and we're not going to change. So on some level, we have to, to open up to the truth of both of these and acknowledge that somehow it doesn't make sense that they're both true, but in a way they are. And, and in that place, I think there actually is the possibility of the kind of transformation we need. Does that speak into the heart of, of what you were highlighting, or is there another question or no, engagement? No, just a, a curiosity. Yeah. If this uh, paradox that was mentioned, yeah. since I'm a very old uh, <coughs> guy, uh, I remember right now this, this statement that the animals have this property of a causal extraterritoriality. Yeah. Yeah. If this is an attribute of only non-human animals, yeah or whether you have any information that mm. is, this also works for man. Yeah, I think it is part of man's nature. Like, and I think there's good examples in psychology that shows that what you're talking about in animals also occurs in humans. What humans also bring is we arguably are an even more complex emotional being. And, and one of the things that often happens with us that I don't think happens with animals, uh, at least not nearly as much, is that humans have competing commitments where we are committed to two contradictory things simultaneously, right? So in that sense, we're often a walking paradox, right? Like, I'm committed to losing weight, and I'm committed to enjoying my chocolate chip cookies after <laughs> dinner, right? So I have these two competing commitments, and, and we find these examples in our life. So as emotional beings, we're very complex and often contradictory, right? Which is partly why I'm highlighting the, you know, 100% support, 100% challenge. The other thing is that even though animals are thinking beings and there's amazing capacities of thinking that occur in animals, they often think in pictures. They're, they're not necessarily verbal thinkers like we are, but they have complex pictorial capacities of thinking and communicating with each other. So they're very dynamic and complex in their thinkings, many of them. But human beings are even more complex in our thinking. Um, and also I think to, to Marcella's point, we tend to have this ability to connect with purpose and spirit and something bigger than ourselves, in a way that hasn't been fully demonstrated with animals. Though with some chimps, there have been documented cases of them coming upon a waterfall and being awestruck and, and just like taking in the beauty and the magnitude of that, right? And so that capacity for awe is pointed to as kind of the beginning of like what might be called a religious sensibility. Right, so, so I think some of that exists there. But so I just think humans are more kind of screwed up emotionally and psychologically <laughs> so that that dynamic you're talking about kind of gets lost in all these other complex emotional and psychological layers that human beings tend to have. Thank you. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Speaking of fear, Sean, uh, there are a lot of uh, scholars that say that even if the most aggressive treaties that are being discussed, ecological treaties that are being discussed, even if those get approved, our natural world as we know it is doomed. Yeah. Do you mm -hmm. share that opinion? Or? Fernando Schultz. Yeah. No. Yeah. It's, I'm agnostic. I could see it going either way. Like, I think there is a chance that we, we've clearly, I think, crossed some thresholds and that there's irreparable damage and, and fallout. And I think we'll continue to see that for, you know, hundreds of years. Like, for me, I often say climate change is a 500-year problem, right? Just as a way of reframing the conversation because we often are trying to solve climate change in a quarterly cycle or in a four-year term, you know, political cycle. Or, and so the progress that gets made then gets, you know, lost with the next, you know, group of individuals that get into those positions of power. And it's just kind of like two steps forward, one step back. And, and yet climate change is probably going to be with us for the next one, two, three, five hundred years. Right? And so when we start thinking of it at that context, it's like, wow, it's a 500-year problem. How are our current approaches and even treaties and, uh, and agreements you know, you know, across the planet, how, are they really dealing with it in that context? And they generally aren't. So, so I think there is a real mismatch between even our best agreements that are emerging um, between governments and, and the full scope of the problem. On the other hand, I think people are amazingly creative. I think we do have phenomenal technologies that can go a long ways to dealing with some of this. And I find nature to be extremely creative, right? So, so there is something about the creativity in the natural world, the creativity in the human species, that while not fully mitigating some of the thresholds we've crossed and some of the damage that is forthcoming almost regardless of what we do from this point forward, I think that creativity, the more we tap into it and bring it in service of what's unfolding and shifting our, our behaviors and our culture and our, our mental models and mindsets, I think can go a long ways to addressing and, and dealing with you know, some of what's coming down the pipe. So, so I feel the dire situation and I feel the creative potential and not just the potential, but when you look out and really study some of what's happening, it's incredible. Right? It's just amazing some of the breakthroughs and some of the things that are happening, both in terms of psychology and culture, in terms of technology. A lot of focus gets placed on the technology solutions. Um, I'm not just talking about that. I'm talking about the cultural creativity, the psychological creativity, the spiritual creativity that is being expressed throughout the planet in a lot of different ways. So, so I feel we're kind of in this moment of like, wow, it could really go either way. So let's get our shit together so we can you know, go in the right direction. So, so thanks. More questions? Yeah, Sean, thank you so much for being here again. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Last time uh, you were here, we were talking about building a, a organizations that have, has, have vision for 100 or 1,000 years. Thousand years uh, yeah. uh, so considering this, this possibility and uh, the way that the integral approach has so been so sophisticated, yeah. uh, this is the lapse or the, the amount of time that we have to start thinking about. Yeah. Because thinking three months, it's not the case yeah. here. Yeah. We will be uh, without water, we will yeah. be without food or whatever. Right. So we need to start thinking long-term view. Yeah about that, that this is the, the, the best approach? Yeah, it's a great question. And of course, as an integralist, I have to say both and, right? So, and, and part of the practice of thinking in a thousand years, and when, you know, because the, the vision of Meta Integral, right? Meta Integral is a collection of organizations that are working together to bring integral principles and apply them to lots of different challenges we face. The vision of Meta Integral is to make a significant contribution to a thriving planetary civilization for the next 1,000 years, right? And, and just to note, Sony has a 500-year business plan, 
right? So, so it's not out of you know question that that we can be thinking in this scope, right? We generally don't. But part of thinking in a thousand years is is not just the long view. It's the long view in service of the short view, right? In service of the three months, because it's like, how do we need to show up and respond to the situation right now, in the next three months, the next year, that's informed by a thousand year view, but uses that to make us more present and more aware of the urgency of what needs to happen now, right? So, so it's both a long view, but it's a long view around being fully present to what's unfolding right now and then situating that urgent responsiveness with respect to the three months, right, in that time frame, and then also situating that in the long view. So again, it's a paradox, right? Because if we just focus on the three months and not thinking about the next 10, 100, 1,000 years, then something's lost. If we're just focused on the 1,000 years and we're not fully attuned to the amazing, painful things that are happening right now, something's lost. So it's about stretching our awareness so that we're, we're profoundly, immediately present and profoundly open and, and connecting with a much larger range and time cycle, right? And, and one thing to, that I want to also say, which connects to what Ricardo was asking around um, organizations, one of the ways that we're working with that is developing a model called 10 Capitals. Right? So there are different frameworks of capital that have been developed that are expanded frameworks like natural capital, financial capital, manufacturing capital, human capital. Right? So to that, we also bring psychological capital, spiritual capital, knowledge capital, health capital, cultural capital, and social capital. So there's 10 capitals. Some of them are monetary and many of them are non-monetary. So it's by creating a new framework of how do we measure value right, that includes, you know, the, the normal ways that we think about capital, but expands that to include elements that are often not included. But what's amazing is there are a lot of frameworks out there that emerged just in the last five to seven years that are these expanded frameworks of capital that are finding ways to include psychological capital and, you know, and cultural capital and social capital. And so there are new forms of integrated accounting that are being used by hundreds of leading organizations across the the planet, including organizations like Patagonia, right? And so there's a, there's a real opportunity, Meta Integral is developing this and working with organizations around how can we develop a, a, an approach to capital that includes these 10 forms, because once you start doing that, then many of the principles here start to become very easy to include, right? So if we start measuring the psychological, cultural, and spiritual capital in organizations, then a very different conversation is possible than what's been possible up to this point. Can I comment something? Yeah. Uh, you can do whatever you want. When Sean first presented this idea of having a thousand years vision for the company, there was a part of me saying, Jesus, this is so arrogant. <laughs> <laughs> but then we start talking and inquiry around, and then I got so amazed into something that is very that resonates quite a lot to me, which is this idea that we not even, most of the time we know that we're gonna die, but we don't feel that we're gonna die. Mm. And then in a hundred years from now, not, I'm not going to be here, but there will be no people around mm. that I know. So, mm. and this idea of uh, connecting with something that goes beyond my ego needs mm. uh, without the total letting go and detachment of outcomes, it's very unique to me. And this idea of connecting with something at this level, it's very powerful because more often than not, I feel people in this sustainability world trying to save the world with a very childish and immature approach. And then more often than not, they are not talking about something outside of themselves that are just trying to save their own, not resolve it, psychological issues. So that's what I like, mm -hmm. what Sean proposed, is how we can, you can connect yourself with something that goes beyond yourself, your generation, your, new, your cultural ways of living with total non-attachment mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and just surrender to whatever. Because mm -hmm. when, when I think it, 
we were, we're talking a lot about ambiguity and paradox. That's very much the current reality and how we deal with the current reality. I mean, there are no fucking answer out there. <laughs> we just have to kind of start in, in, in knowing how to navigate and in this place of not knowing, moment to moment. Right. And to build on that a little, so it's not that I am that concerned about whether Meta Integral as an organization or a group of organizations actually will be around in a thousand years. Right? So that's not the point of, of framing it up that way. Though it is interesting to note that there are over a dozen organizations on the planet that are a thousand years old. So it, it has been done and it will be done more. Seven of them come from Japan, which is quite interesting. But so it's less about whether Meta Integral actually exists in a thousand years. And it's more about for however long Meta Integral is around, whether it's 20 years or 100 years or whatever, that every day we want to show up connected to the orientation that we want to act as if we're going to be around for a thousand years. And how does that change what we do and our approach to working with organizations, our approach to team building, our approach to being in relationship to this planet? How does that change when we hold that bigger vision? Because it does open you up into something much larger than yourself, and we want to bring that forward day to day in what we do. And this, this brings responsibility, but yeah. also empowerment, because... Yeah. Yeah. yeah, beautiful, yeah, exactly. Allow me a comment. Yes. The life cycle of a small company mm -hmm. is not more than seven or eight years. Yeah. <clears throat> Big companies, perhaps, will not last more than 80 years. Yeah. They will be merged, bought and closed and shut down. And uh, <clears throat> I will start saying that the sustainability of sustainability is ecology, <clears throat> nothing else. <clears throat> because we are talking about carrying capacity. We are talking about the provision of natural resources for human survival yeah. as a species. If the discourse of uh, looking for a hundred years, we will go over the life cycle of 90% uh, of companies. Perhaps in 80 years, not more than 5% of the companies that are existing today will be here. Yeah. Not even the CEOs or the <coughs> etc. except some. <coughs> Whom to address to? Despite they believe they are going to be around in many years, but they are not okay. going <laughs> Who do we address this message of uh, 1,000 years planning if the company will no longer be here? Of course, it has to be a human culture as a human species, not as a human living being. <clears throat> Who to, should we address this message? Because I think you have this message in the book. Yeah. So how to optimize it? Mm. How to express it? How to leave a landmark so that right. someone will be keeping remember this? Yeah. There are some people that are thinking in terms of 1,000 years. Yeah. Mm. 500 years goes just like that. Mm -hmm. 2,000 years goes like that. From the planet point of view, from the sustainability point of view, as ecology mm. because we need resources and we need the ecological services yeah. and if they go we go together mm. what is the message and to whom this should be addressed mm. it's a great question and it's the kinds of questions that get evoked when we start to talk about a thousand years mm. so you know I, I don't have an answer other than I think it's a really good question because it's like that kind of question we start thinking about mm. You know, what do we mean by this? Like, what's the point because of this? This, yeah. is the, this is the tool for it. This yeah. is the, the book is the tool for it. Right. How to address it? Yeah. Well, and one of the ways we're approaching Meta Integral is not as a single organization, but rather as an ecology of organizations. So, Meta Integral is actually comprised of a foundation, like a nonprofit, a consulting firm, and a leadership academy. And then we're building strategic partners. Right, and creating what we call a meta integral alliance. And in a sense, the vision of it is actually to create an ecology of organizations that 
that it's a healthy ecology of organizational relationships that models a different way of being on this planet. So in a sense, any one of the meta-integral organizations could pass out of existence, but there's an ecology that we're trying to create, an organizational ecology of, with bringing together hundreds of visionary organizations around the planet to be in this ecology, right? So in a way, it's like that's one way that this vision of a thousand years has showed up about not being a single organization that's trying to live for a thousand years, right? Because in a way, that, that can be an arrogant project, but more like can we create an ecosystem of relationship between these different organizations that have sustainability at the core of them and they can practice a form of capitalism that looks very different than current forms because as an ecosystem, we are trafficking in currencies related to all 10 capitals, right? So that we create a very different economy within the relationships of those organizations. So that in this sense, Meta Integral is wanting to create a, a new kind of economy that's much more, you know, ecological in its orientation and is including all the different forms of capital that aren't currently included in our for it, current version of economy, right? Because in a way, it gets back to what I was saying, like, if we want to be sustainable, we have to include more of reality. Yeah. So if we want to be sustainable in an economic sense, we have to include psychological capital, we have to include health capital, we have to include social capital. If we're not including those in our economy, then our economy actually doesn't match our ecology, right? So I think for me, who do we address? We address anyone who will listen and be inspired and called to reconsidering the mental models that we have around business as usual and what are the creative new configurations and new relationships that we can create that enable a more sustainability, um, a more sustainable way of being on this planet. And while you're talking about it, there is a very interesting story about an almost 700 years old organization, which are the Jesuits. And then there are two very interesting stories about the longevity, because the Jesuits, uh, they kind of um, localized their value proposition to the world. And then there was a very interesting mm -hmm. story about when they first went to, China, to India. So there were Christians that went before the Jesuits to India. They have mass, and they have people that follow the Christian mm -hmm. traditions, and, but because the mass were in, in Latin. And then uh, the first Jesuits start talking with the people from India, and they didn't know who Christ was, because there was... Uh, <laughs> and then they realized that they have to kind of localize, they have to kind of adapt in a way that in, they have to mm. bring the message in the local language. And there's this amazing, beautiful way of the Jesuits do their own inquiry that every day before they start the day, they have a series of uh, questions and answer that if I would live my day as Christ today, how mm. would I behave and uh, what mm. kind of actions I would take along the day? And before bed, they answered the same questions and they mm. went to the day mm. with a very high bar. So based on all the behaviors I had during the day, mm in relationship with Christ, how it perform, and always yeah. it's a, <laughs> it's a very, and then it's very interesting because it's a kind of practice that is rooted mm -hmm. in a 700 year organization. Yeah. It's very wow. interesting. Yeah, it's great. Uh, we will continue this dialogue here, but uh, I have to end the, you know, the broadcast and uh, close this episode. So we mentioned the Pope, the Jesuits, you know. <laughs> but I want, I want, <laughs> I want, I want you to mention something about the the Meta Integral Institute. Can you say something? What you, what are you doing in Brazil yeah. Yeah. right now? Yeah, uh, we Sean is here this week to launch Meta Integral Brazil, and then uh, tomorrow we're gonna have an event for. It's gonna be a breakfast for. Inv People, some people here are going to be part of, uh, people from human resources, from different companies, and from sustainability world, and from some areas of innovation, where we are going to present Meta Integral, present Sean, and offer a little bit of experience around everything that Sean said. So our approach to create an agile uh, and transformative organization is uh, how you create context of flourish potential of the individuals that creating resilient and health communities and relationship change the systems they work. So tomorrow we're going to offer a little bit of it. And also we are going to bring to Brazil a very unique program, 
that we're going to launch on Friday, which is a certification in um, consulting and integral consulting and facilitation. That's going to be a one year and a half program that it, w what we've learned that good facilitation and consultants are not those who has quite a lot of method methodologies and try to impose methodology in, into the environments they enter, but it's more how they show up and they embody characters and then they, they have this capacity and boldness to step into a void of a space in a group and, and, and co-create with this group transformation. It's going to be a, I think it's very, it's the unique in Brazil, and I don't know in the world if there are some more out there yeah. with this approach. There is kind of 60% uh, around personal transformation, very deep personal, spiritual, psychological, somatic transformation, 20% around consulting and facilitation skills, and 20% around bringing content, methodology, and, 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 and technology around it. So. That's great. Very good. Yeah. So that's the reason why this guy is here. It's yeah, not only the, the book, new. right? No. Okay. There's a lot of good reasons to come. There to are many reasons to come. Yeah, <laughs> many. And you are very welcome. And I, I want to thank you for, for mm. being here with us in this mainscape. Yeah, thank you. It's really delightful. Thank you. Uh, we. Obrigado, Marcelo. Não, de novo, Marcelo. Né? Obrigado você por abrir espaço, por abrir sua casa sempre. Imagina, muito generoso, muito imagina, legal. Cara. Obrigado mesmo. Eu vou encerrar o episódio aqui. Vocês que estão aí vão ficar com inveja, porque a turma que está aqui vai continuar não só conversando com o Chan, mas também comendo aqui na Vila Madalena. <risos> certo? E a noite aqui na Vila é uma criança. Eu queria só recomendar uma... Me veio aqui o episódio que a gente gravou com o Ari com a Lilian. O Ari e a Lilian estão aqui, ó. eu botei até eles na câmera aqui, ó. eles estão aqui, ó, quietinhos aqui. Essa dupla é incrível aqui. Professor fizeram... Portado parece, apareceu Professor... bastante. Apareceu também, né? É, ele está aqui. Fez também. os comentários dele brilhantemente. É, gente como incríveis, incríveis pessoas aqui hoje na, na nossa, no nosso Tem espaço. Que falar do Quer falar do livro? É, lá. fazer a propaganda. Então, então faça já, <risos> faça já. Ah, eu acho que tem uma coisa super legal, um dos, motivos, um dos projetos do Instituto Integral Brasil é fundial a, a impressão do, do desse livro, livro do que o Ari traduziu. E então, você que está olhando, você olha para o site da onde, Isabela? Onde que, onde que as pessoas estiverem interessadas, a gente vai lançar... Onde? Eu, eco do bem.com.br, o Maurício vai colocar... Eu publico aqui na descrição do vídeo, quem tiver assistido. publicar e as pessoas vão entrar lá para ajudar a trazer essa mensagem em português que vai ser bastante útil para muita gente. Beleza, Marcelo. Muito legal, cara. E eu queria lembrar desse episódio que a Lilian e o Ari gravaram, porque é um episódio muito legal, porque eles fizeram uma análise do contexto do Brasil sobre os olhos da ecologia integral. E está publicado aqui na série. Foi o último episódio que a gente gravou e ele foi um... parece que foi uma cereja de bolo aí, no fechamento, acho que do ano passado. Então está aqui, está na, na nossa playlist. Chama Ecologia Integral com a, Li, com a Ari e com a Lilian. E dá para entender um pouco mais a fundo do que a gente está falando aqui. Queria agradecer a vocês todos que estão aqui. A gente continua aqui, tá certo? Continuamos aqui. Eu só vou fechar o episódio. Eu agradeço que vocês estiveram ao vivo conosco. A gente se vê no, no próximo encontro. Um grande beijo para todos. Música